welcome and this is Derry Gimler Bog. It's important to Ireland for two historical reasons and three important people and as if that wasn't enough stats let's go and have a look. Marconi made this place famous for the first successful commercial Morse code transmission wirelessly across the Atlantic 1922 to 1923. And this commemorates the second event on this site in June 1919. A Mr. Alcock and a Mr. Brown ditched their transatlantic flight somewhere over there in the bog. This is technically now the entrance. A little less well guarded it was back in the time of Mr. Marconi. Let's go and see what he left here when he employed over 400 people on a bogland in Ireland to send Morse code across the Atlantic. Sounds crazy these days, but apparently back then it was the biggest leap in technological advances of its time. And due to the commercial nature of this race to get Morse code wirelessly across the Atlantic, this site was heavily guarded. This is the former entrance. There's not much here now, but during the First World War, it was heavily guarded by British troops as the stuff that Marconi put here was seen as vital for code breaking and the sending of communications to win the war. A smart man like Marconi knew that he needed to be out there for the peat, but couldn't be too far away from here the main road for access. He needed to be out there because it was closest to the Atlantic. The transmission towers had a clear line of sight across the bay. The only problem he had was the peat was here and the main road towards Cleggan was over there. A smart man like Marconi built himself a railway. At one point, Marconi employed over 90 people to dig this stuff. It's peat, it's all across this bog. And he burnt the peat in his turbine hall. He stored it in his condenser hall. And from his condenser hall, he used that electric to wirelessly transmit Morse code across the Atlantic. From here, a complete and utter wilderness. This bogland developed over 4,000 years. The peat here, all the way across the landscape, is one of the most intact areas in Europe of this type of land. Marconi's men dug the peat out and still to this day, these lakes have developed in the lines where they would dig. Digging for the peat that gave them the power to transmit across the Atlantic. This is Marconi's condenser house, or at least what's left of it, over a hundred years on. This is where he originally patented a lot of his methods. On the ground floor was the transmission equipment to enable him to send that Morse code across the Atlantic. On the first floor was his patented equipment, including his magnetic disk drives and his spark method. And then finally on the second floor of this humongous condenser house was the world's largest battery at the time. 6,000 cells keeping all of the power from burning that peat that came from the bog. Behind me is the site of Morconi's powerhouse. And this is what it looked like circa 1911. It truly was a powerhouse. This is all that is left of what was quite possibly the loudest area across Marconi's 300 acre site. This powerhouse once housed six steam boilers, two vertical steam engines, 
two alternators and four dynamos, of which could put through 15,000 volts to the batteries across there. This is all that remains of something that was truly a powerhouse of engineering and technology. This behind me is the remains of the engineer's bungalow. In 1911, it housed two men, two very important men, Franklin and Round, two very well-known radio engineers of their time. Round was the co-inventor of the thermatic valve and Franklin, well, he made the short beam radio system. It revolutionized how radio worked at the time. This is the engineer's bungalow, circa 1912, how it looked originally when the two men lived there. Here once stood six two-story cottages. After their completion in 1911, they were intended to house the station's skilled workers. This is what is left of the social club. It allowed the 40 permanent staff that were here throughout the year to relax away from the noisy machinery. It included billiards, books, and much more. This behind me is probably the smallest building on site, the receiving house. Built between 1908 and 1909, it's allowed those sending and receiving messages to be moved from the noisy end of the site with the generators and the powerhouse to a quieter, more secluded side. It was here that in 1919, the operators tapped out the message, Alcock and Brown have landed. The weather may have changed and continuity may be out the door, but behind me, is what was the manager's house, the most westerly structure on the site. And as with any engineering project, it's the furthest away from the workers and it's the furthest away from the noise. He slept very nicely at night when 24 hours, the powerhouse was booming over there in the east. Behind me is a beautiful lake, the Lake of Derry Gimli. Popular with the anglers on site, this lake houses brown trout and eels. Around the sides of the lake, very distinctively, you can see where they've gouged out the peat from the bog to burn. The lake itself slowly widened, till today we have this. A beautiful still lake that looks out across the entire Marconi site all the way up to the Alcock and Brown Memorial site and beyond to the Ben Mountains. Just got to think to yourself, all of this is in Ireland. Two hour flight from anywhere in the UK.